Today we will be discussing bionics. In other words, replacement organs for humans. I will tell you about the electronic ear, the artificial heart, and the synthetic hand. No matter how interesting a TV program may be, if you can only see the images and not hear the sound, you'll be missing something. Fortunately, the most popular shows on television are now coded for the hearing impaired. One child in a thousand is born deaf, and approximately 10% of the population will suffer sooner or later from some form of hearing problem. People 65 and over are the most affected. One out of three seniors suffers from a relatively serious hearing problem. To be deaf is to be isolated. Until very recently, totally or profoundly deaf persons were condemned to a world of silence. Nowadays, owing to the development of what is known as the cochlear implant, medical science is able to help. The sensory cells of the internal ear can be replaced by electrodes that send sound messages to the brain. Among the senses that connect us to our environment, hearing is without a doubt one of the most important. Without your sense of hearing, you cannot communicate verbally, cannot quickly be warned of danger, nor appreciate the pleasures of music. Sounds are waves that enter the pavilion of the ear and cause a fine membrane called the tympanum or eardrum to vibrate. These vibrations are amplified ten times by the three structures of the ear, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The vibrations are then conveyed to the internal ear, to the sensory cells, located inside a small snail-shaped organ called the cochlea, which pick up sound. Each of roughly 30,000 such cells perceives a different sound frequency. These cells convert sound into an electrical signal that is relayed to the brain by the auditory nerve. In people who have no hearing at all, these cells have usually been damaged and are therefore not capable of sending the impulse to the brain. A hereditary disease can cause total deafness, as can a serious head injury or illness, such as meningitis. Not so long ago, people suffering from total deafness were condemned to a life of silence. However, a few years ago, science developed an electronic ear that can partially replace a deaf person's non-functioning ear. Hearing is the first of our senses that scientists have managed to reproduce, at least in part. So people who were once completely deaf can now follow conversations, hear cars, and make telephone calls. The multi-electrode cochlear implant is one such electronic ear. The external part of the device consists of a microphone which captures sound. The microphone transmits the sound to a vocal processor that selects and encodes the most useful sounds for language comprehension. The coded sounds are then conveyed to an emitter, which for its part sends them through the skin to a receiver in the internal ear. The receiver is surgically implanted in the bone located behind the ear. It involves microsurgery performed under general anesthesia. The receiver converts the coded sounds into electrical signals. Patients having undergone a cochlear implant do not, however, regain their hearing instantaneously. For about a month after the operation, the patient must heal.
then follows a period of adjustment during which the electrodes are calibrated. This can last for several weeks or months. Also, the sounds now perceived are not the same as those heard naturally. People fitted with such implants say the sounds they hear are more metallic, more nasal sounding. The electronic ear is implanted more frequently in people who have lost their hearing, as opposed to those born deaf, since they can compare the sounds they hear after the implant with those they have stored in their memory. As a rule, people equipped with these aids will recover 30 to 40 percent of their hearing faculties. With the cochlear implant, medical science has taken an important step by enabling the deaf to regain some degree of independence. And in the future, rapid technological progress bodes well for the development of a highly sophisticated ear, one that might even surpass the human ear. Cochlear implants can help people whose sensory cells have been destroyed. But once their auditory nerve has been affected, nothing can be done. If we could implant electrodes directly inside the cranium, right in the auditory tracts of the central nervous system, there would be no problem. And there's a good chance of that being possible someday. Other organs have been included in the Bionic Man catalog. There's hardly a part of the human anatomy that we have not tried to replace, with various degrees of success the kidneys, the liver, the skin, the cornea, the heart. Progress in the spare parts department has been amazing. However, there is one very serious stumbling block, and that's a lack of donors, further found at the right time. No wonder scientists are striving to develop an artificial heart. The heart is a muscular pump the size of a fist whose function is to circulate blood throughout the body. The heart of the average 70-year-old person will have pumped 4 million liters of blood during the person's lifetime without ever requiring service or a tune-up. It is far more efficient than any man-made pump. People who exercise regularly will notice that, at rest, their pulse gradually decreases as their physical training progresses. However, scientists have yet to find a cause and effect link between this decrease in pulse rate and overall improvement in health. Similarly, for a long time it was believed that intensive physical training caused the heart to increase in size. But studies have revealed that it is virtually impossible to detect variations in heart size after physical exertion. However, despite its high performance, the heart isn't spared failure. Every year, hundreds of millions of people die of heart disease. It's one of the major causes of death in industrialized countries. In actual fact, the heart is a dual pump. It consists of a right heart and a left heart. The right heart pumps blood to the lungs, while the left heart sends it through the rest of the body. Both pumps have two chambers. The blood enters the first chamber, or oracle. It's sort of a waiting room in which the blood is compressed. Then, under the pressure, the valve separating the two cavities opens, and the blood is sent into the ventricle. Once filled, the second chamber, larger and more muscular than the first, vigorously contracts, expelling the blood through the body's blood vessels or to the lungs. Sometimes, however, this marvelous pump weakens and develops serious coronary problems. Most often, the heart expands to such an extent that it can no longer function normally. In other cases, the blood vessels are blocked, causing part of the heart to die. 
This is coronary thrombosis. The hearts of some people are in such poor shape, they have to be replaced by healthy ones. Doctors have been performing heart transplants for about 20 years now. As a rule, the hearts are taken from accident victims and transplanted into waiting patients. The success of the operations depends greatly on the availability of compatible hearts when they are needed. Moreover, although cyclosporin is used to lower the body's natural defense mechanisms, 20% of heart transplant patients die as a result of rejection. To overcome these odds, scientists have for a long time dreamed of being able to substitute an artificial heart for a human one. The Jarvik 7 heart, made mostly of polyurethane plastic, simulates the two ventricles of the human heart. The two units are held together by a strip of Velcro. During the operation, the cardiologist first withdraws the ailing heart's two ventricles and replaces them with the artificial heart. During the surgery, the patient is kept alive by a heart-lung apparatus to which he is connected. The artificial ventricles are attached to the healthy oracles of the diseased heart. Two plastic tubes connect the Jarvik 7 heart's two chambers to an external compressor which sends pressurized air into each of them. Under the pressure, the membrane in each cavity tightens and evacuates the blood, sending it through the body or to the lungs. This pneumatic system is connected to a microcomputer that provides diagnostic information, such as the blood flow per heartbeat. It can also determine if the body has a sufficient amount of blood. The heartbeat and the pressure in the artificial heart are adjusted manually by the medical staff. Any hope scientists may have nurtured to make the Jarvik 7 a permanent artificial heart have been dashed due to post-operative complications. Unfortunately, infection often sets in, or blood clots form and obstruct the plastic heart. Also, the size of the compressor and the microcomputer hooked up to the patient's heart considerably hinder the recipient's freedom of movement. Today, the Jarvik 7 heart is used chiefly on patients who are waiting for a heart transplant. The patients keep it only for short periods, from a few days to several weeks. At present, then, the Jarvik 7 heart mainly serves in a stopgap capacity. What researchers are striving for, however, is a mechanical heart capable of functioning for several years without patients being severely inconvenienced. Whether the heart is from a donor or artificial, Heart transplants raise all kinds of ethical and moral issues. According to one of the pioneers of organ transplants, Dr. Willem Kolf, organ transplants must not only serve to prolong life, they must also make it more pleasant. Perhaps the only truly bionic man would be the one who was capable of regenerating himself at will, and as required, a little like starfish whose arms grow back after having been cut off. Several thousands of amputations are performed each year as a result of diabetes, infection, accidents, or cancer. But even if some of our cells, like our skin, can replace themselves on a regular basis, a leg or an arm will never grow back. So replacing an organ as complex as the human hand by an artificial limb is no mean task. Touch, pick up, handle. We use our hands continuously. As a matter of fact, the hand is one of the human body's most complex parts. The human hand is exceptionally agile. Its extraordinary ability is due to the action of the thumb that is opposable to each of the fingers. 
thanks to the thumb, the hand can grasp objects easily and handle them with great precision. The amputation of a hand, therefore, constitutes a severe handicap. Researchers have been attempting to create an artificial hand that will give amputees greater autonomy. Usually, amputees are fitted with a prosthesis that resembles a claw encased in a plastic glove. It opens and closes in a single movement. It enables the wearer to grasp objects. However, this artificial limb has a number of drawbacks. For instance, in some cases, the amputee must lift the elbow quite high to correct the angle of the claw holding the object. Engineers and biophysics experts have joined forces to solve problems of this kind by creating a new prototype. The objective is to create a hand capable of reproducing the human hand's essential movements. The artificial hand they designed works with an electric motor fitted in its palm. Movement is controlled by electrical impulse from two arm muscles. When the amputee thinks about closing his hand, his brain sends a nerve signal down the arm nerves to the muscles. Electrodes placed on the skin of the forearm pick up the signal. The signal is then carried by wire to a small electronic circuit that controls the motor of the prosthesis and which interprets it. The fingers are then activated by a system of gears and pulleys. Like a natural hand, the thumb of the artificial hand can assume two main positions. Studies reveal that for most daily tasks, we use two main prehensile modes. One, we grasp with three fingers to pick up minute objects, like a pencil. And two, the lateral position, which enables us to pick up flat objects, like a key or a playing card. Both categories of movement are made easier by the trajectory of the thumb. We owe the design of this artificial hand to a powerful data processing software program with which researchers can design a 3D prototype of the hand. With it, they can establish the length of the fingers, their positioning, and optimum bending angles for adequate prehension. Through trial and error, the researchers established the optimum configuration for their hand. Computer-aided design helps them modify the position of one or more fingers by translation and rotation movements. This software program enables researchers to simulate prehensile movements of the hand and visualize areas of interference between the hand and the object on the monitor. The red crosses and lines indicate areas where the hand touches the object. If the areas of contact are insufficient, the grasp will be inadequate and the hand may drop the object. Also, if the fingers are badly positioned, they may touch each other and hinder prehensile movements. Computer-aided design is an extremely valuable tool. Its use is becoming more and more widespread as it can systematically configurate every option possible for various devices before they are manufactured. An artificial hand better suited to amputees was possible because of it. It also paved the way for the design of new artificial limbs. Today, amputees participate in all kinds of activities. Society allows those among us who are different to enjoy an active life. Some doctors predict that by the year 2000, one operation in two will be a living or artificial organ transplant. <laughs>